Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, when we have the Lord's Supper once a month, we purposed not to rush through it, not to tack it on almost as an afterthought, but rather to bring our focused attention to this wonderful ordinance. And what that means monthly is that we have a little less time to, to teach and preach from the scriptures. So what I wanna do today is we're going through 1 Corinthians, uh, looking at this, this overarching subject, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church, which is good news, by the way, for every church, because every church is imperfect. Uh, and we're looking right now in this section, chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, introducing the discussion of spiritual gifts and the abuse of those spiritual gifts that were taking place in Corinth. Uh, I want us to read uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to impose on you and ask you to stand with me one more time, one more time as we as we read the scriptures, you follow along as I read these verses, and we're going to kind of do a, a meditation type devotion around what we've participated in today. Listen to Paul addressing the next controversy, issue he has with the church at Corinth. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. I want the Lord to teach us, because as I said when we entered this portion of the study, I would love to see the Spirit of God come upon us and among us and, and strengthen and energize us, as the Scripture says, to manifest the various giftedness, the charismata, because that turns a regular congregation into an army that makes hell tremble. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I want to call attention again to your bulletin. Just real quickly today, I want you to take it, look at it. This is going to be our graphic on the bulletin until we get through the end of chapter 14. I want you to recognize some things about it. The, the language that's in a regular type is introducing in each of those sections uh, various aspects of the charismata. When you find a word uh, in italics, it means it's been previously mentioned uh, in one of the passages. And I want you to look at that and study that. And I want you to start drawing some conclusions about, about what showed up in prominence in these four areas. We just read today, responsively, the fourth of these, 1 Peter 4. And we'll be reading back over them again as we go through this study. But call attention to that real quickly for you. I would remind you that a spiritual gift, as we're looking at it, is an ability to express, celebrate, display, and communicate Christ in a way that builds up and strengthens the faith of other Christians and enlarges the church. Also, spiritual gifts are classified into, typically into speaking gifts, gifts uh, surrounding the ability of speech, or of what we call practical, loving practical helps uh, and, and signs. Okay, we'll be looking at that as we get directly into the gifts uh, tell you real quickly where we're going. Next Sunday, Lord willing, Karen and I will be at the Southern Baptist Convention in Dallas. Norman Hare will, will capably uh, stand and teach and preach here on Sunday morning. Joshua Askell will 
capably stand and teach and preach on Sunday evening for you. Be here for that. Next Sunday is Father's Day. We'll be taking a look in exhorting fathers from the scriptures about what God has called us to be and to do. And then the following Sunday, Lord willing, we'll dive right back into this and begin to bear down on uh, the meaning of these gifts as they're spelled out uh, in these verses in the middle portion of this chapter and in chapter 14 specifically. So hang with us. We are going to get there. Third, every Christian is gifted with the charismata. And I doubt that any Christian is only given one. <laughs> I, think we're, I think we're given uh, several, and we're hopefully going to challenge you uh, to think about that seriously. Chapter 12, I told you, is a survey uh, of the gifts. It emphasizes, as we just read there, it emphasizes uh, the, uh, the common origin, the spirit, the same spirit, the one spirit. It speaks of a diversity, and then it makes very clear a purpose for the common good. Chapter 13 is Paul's corrective to the abuse of gifts in Corinth when he brings the more excellent way, love, agape love. And then chapter 14, having set the stage, having showed them how to handle these matters with love, what love looks like, he then takes on his great concern in Corinth, the abuse of the gift of tongues. And so we'll be looking at that that way. And then he gives some concluding directions on what does this have to do with worship, okay? So we've been looking for the last couple of Sundays at this informed understanding of spiritual gifts. Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. And we told you in these verses that the first three verses are the test of, uh, of speaking in the Spirit. When a person speaks, whether he's in the congregation, whether he's in a, in a Bible study time, whether he's standing in the pulpit, is he speaking in the Spirit? Does it qualify for that from the biblical test? We looked at that last week. The next section we're looking at now is the diversity of spiritual gifts. And once we've gotten through that in a few weeks from now, then we will look at the illustration of the body. He takes that whole body language thing, which is so critical to understand how a church is to, is to serve together, minister together, bless together. And so we looked at those first three verses. We got down last week to uh, verse 11, and I want us to come back there today as we think about what we've just celebrated together and how the Lord's Supper influences our informed understanding of these things. Verse 7 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And this verse, again, says that every person, to each believer, or every believer, there's this manifestation of the Spirit. You know, you can say, I have the Holy Spirit, but the reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit cannot be hidden. He manifests himself. He's not a weak little childish reality in us. And we said last week, he's not an it. He's not just an influence. He's not an idea. He's a person whom Jesus sent when he said, it's necessary that I go away, but I will not leave you as orphans. I will send the comforter. We know the great creeds and confessions declare that, that God sent Jesus, the, the eternally begotten, was sent by God to walk this earth, to live a perfect life of sinless obedience to the law of God, to die that vicarious, sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing uh, death on the cross on behalf of God, to rise again from the grave. The Father sent the Son. The Scripture teaches us that the Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. I appreciate what's happening on Wednesday nights with our with our children, Josue Hernandez is teaching them the Apostles' Creed. Bravo for that, Jose. Bravo. That's right. That's wonderful. Do you know? Do you know how few people know that? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands to see if you know it. You have your children here on Wednesday nights. They will know it. 
the earliest confession of the church. And so we have this, this promise of the Spirit. And in the promise of the Spirit, as He comes to us in the new birth, when we are born again, the Spirit comes, He gives us new life. He brings us from death to life. He makes us partakers of the divine nature, Peter says. And in that, He places within us the charismata. Not only does He enable us to repent of our sin and believe in Christ, He places in us the charismata. They're there in germ form or in, in a diamond in the rough form. And they're to be discovered, cultivated, demonstrated. That we might have the manifestation of the Spirit, which should be the reality of every believer. Paul also in this verse challenges the Corinthians that they get off their high horse. We saw this in the early verses of chapters 1, 2, and 3, that they, they had a party spirit, putting themselves in a position of superiority over others. And Paul is going to have none of that in Corinth. And so he, he chides them about that, rebukes them, attaching special importance to some gifts over another. And also this verse shows that the Spirit is the source. In fact, it's, it's interesting. He is the one who gives, who empowers. He is the one from whom we manifest giftedness. And so it seemed to me, in the light of those things, I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5 for a few minutes today, verses 17 to 21. Because you cannot talk meaningfully about spiritual giftedness, the charismata, you cannot talk about that unless you have an intelligent understanding of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Look at verses 17 to 21, chapter 5. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand. Isn't it interesting? We have this same word cropping up as in, as in uh, 1 Corinthians. Understand what the will of the Lord is, what this, His revealed will is for His believers. And so you got to verses 18 and following. Do not get drunk with wine or stop being drunk with wine. These Corinthians, many of them came out of the cult of Dionysus, which was connected to the, to the whole Bacchan uh, orgies, wine orgies. Very emotional, very sensual. And Paul is writing and saying, you've got to put that behind you. Stop being drunk with wine. Stop embracing lifestyle and calling it worship. Because keep on being filled with the Spirit. The attitude they had was debauchery. It was sinful. It brought reproach for them to say that they were engaged in that sort of conduct in the name of God. It was shameful. But be filled. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. It's critical. It's critical. So we're going to look at it when we get into the tongues issue in 14, chapter 14. The continual filling of the Spirit is a manifestation of the reality of the Spirit in our lives. He doesn't tell you how to do that. Nowhere in the Scripture do you have any of the apostles instructing you to say, here's how you're filled with the Spirit. What he says is, this is what being filled with the Spirit looks like. Look at verse 19. Addressing or speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual psalms. And that happens in corporate worship. A person who habitually is absent from corporate worship cannot do this. You can't mail it in. You can't send an audio file. This is to be done in the context of corporate worship. Speaking to one another. Remember, what we've taught this through Ephesians in years past. When we come and sing praise to God, we are praising Him. The Scripture says He inhabits the praise of His people, but we are speaking to one another. We're speaking to one another. Jesus said concerning the Lord's Supper, as often as you do this, as you, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until He comes. It's a congregational proclamation of the gospel. In the same way, congregational singing, psalms, and hymns, and spiritual songs. There's, a, there's an array of categories of songs that can be lifted up to God. And the main th thing is that they speak the truth about who He is. They declare the triune reality. I love, Josh, a couple of those that you picked today. Address the, the Father, address the Son, address the Spirit. The triune reality of our worship, the triune God. And then that comes, you know where it starts? You know where that desire to, to 
address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs starts. It starts in the heart, singing and making melody in your heart to God. I don't know about you, but what I experience is when, when, I, when I meditate upon the Lord, when I read His Word, there begins to be stirred in my heart a song of praise to our God. When I come into the midst of the people of God and we sing unto Him psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, there is stirred up in me anew and afresh so that I will leave this place. I promise you, I'll leave it today singing, making melody in my heart to God. And then there's an attitude. Being filled with the Spirit is a, is a heart of thanksgiving. You cannot have the Spirit dwelling and reigning within you. It'd be a grumbling, critical, cynical, sour Christian. Giving thanks to God for everything. Now, that's not, that's not the grinning idiot tele-evangelist, you know. Well, praise the Lord anyway. No, that's not it. It's a deep-seated heart of gratitude that even receives difficult providences. Like, Lord, I deserve so much worse than that. Oh, I thank you for mercy, keeping mercy, sanctifying mercy, saving mercy, giving thanks to God for everything and always in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because see, how can we ever be ungrateful when we think about what God has given to us? And then finally, submitting to one another. You see, we're back. You see where, we, where this ties in? The gifts are given for the common good. When you experience anyone who in the name of manifesting the charismata, the grace gifts, puffs himself up, calls attention to himself. If I'm up here calling attention to myself, get rid of me. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, if I've been born again and you've been born again, and you have the Spirit dwelling in you, I have the Spirit dwelling in me. It shouldn't be difficult for us to serve one another. It shouldn't be difficult to wash one another's feet. It shouldn't be difficult to bear one another's burdens. It shouldn't be difficult to care for one another. It shouldn't be difficult to think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. If the Spirit is regnant in us and is cultivating in us the grace gifts, because you see they are given for the common good. And that's the climate that I want us to have as we, as we delve further into the study of the charismata. So you'll think about these things. Receive with an attitude of submission. Lord, I want to be used by you to bless these people. And you know what happens. When you have that kind of attitude cultivated, committed to blessing the brothers and sisters, do you know what? You, you cannot... Drop that at the door when you leave this place. When you have an attitude of wanting to bless the brothers and sisters and serve them and submit to them, that carries over. That carries over. It begins to spill over into relationships where you want to serve others. You want to bless others. It's inevitable. And all of this is flowing out of the recognition, the embracing, the discovering and the cultivating of the charismata that each one of you, my brothers and sisters, have in you by virtue of you having been born again, saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, saved to serve. I will close with this. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not the grace, not the salvation, not even the faith originates with you. It's a gift of God, he says, not of work, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. We've taught this when we taught Ephesians. His poema, his poem, his anthology of poems. That's what we are here at Bethel. You get to know one person, another person. You, you're reading their poem of God's grace, and you realize it's the same, same woven theme, and yet he, he did it in their lives in somewhat different circumstances, but the, we all manifest the same common theme of salvation. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on two good works. Can't escape it. I wouldn't give you a nickel for a fellow who says he's saved and isn't interested in, in 
manifesting a heart of servanthood for others because it contradicts page after page of revealed scripture. Are you saved here today? Are you saved? You see, what I'm telling you may sound like Russian to you. I don't know. You need to encounter Jesus Christ. But oh, when you do, when you cry out to him for mercy and he shows you mercy, he says, I will not turn away anyone who comes to me. And the Spirit comes and gives you the new birth, enabling you to repent of sin and believe in Christ, trust in Christ, beginning to manifest a life of hatred for sin and love for God and His Word and His will and His way. And then you're blessed if when you're first converted, you're put on a path to discover how has He gifted you to serve. That's my heart's desire for everyone here today. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you when we see page after page, demonstration after demonstration of your unspeakable, unfathomable love for sinners. You sent Jesus Christ to live and die and rise again for us. You sent the Holy Spirit to apply that, that so great salvation accomplished by the Savior to make application of it in the hearts of all for whom he intended, O oh God. And then you, you haven't left us orphans. You've planted your spirit within us to make us more and more like Jesus Christ, to strengthen us and enable us by grace to, to make something of a, a little taste of heaven in the local church congregations that you've given us. Oh, God, have mercy on us. Strengthen and sanctify every believer here today. Save Every person here who is not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, we ask in his name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand.